It's my pleasure to introduce Tim Chapman to you, and I'm sure many of you in this room will be very familiar with Tim. But for those of you who are here for the first time, Tim is one of the leaders here at the church. He's one of the eldership team. And I have to say, personally, I really value Tim as a friend, and I also really value Tim's advice. Often when I'm uh, wanting an opinion or wanting to, I don't know, not sure what to do, I will, I will contact Tim, and whatever he says back to me is always helpful always measured. I really value him in our team. I value his advice. I value him as a friend. He's a very, very good Bible teacher as well. And so I'm already excited to introduce to you my friend and yours, Tim Chapman. Come and join me, Tim. Thank you, Adrian. Well, hello, everyone. Good to see you. Um, as Adrian said, my name's Tim. For those of you I don't know, I'm part of the church here. Um, I'm married to Rachel. Uh, we've got four kids aged between three and 11. And, um, and for my job, I, I work in, in London, I work in financial services. And so one of the things that I spend quite a lot of time doing, especially at the moment, is reading research papers. And it's because I work in the area of artificial intelligence. And as you can imagine, there's lots of research going on in that area. Um, but I read a paper this week that was unlike anything I'd read before, specifically for this series. And it was about three groups of people that were asked to do three different things over the course of 10 weeks. So the first group of people were asked every day to write down some things that day that they were grateful for. And then the second group of people were asked to kind of write down some things that irritated them just to try and get it off their chest. And then the third group of people were asked to write a mix of things, a bit of a control sample for the experiment. I don't know who you think would have, like, how people would have responded over the course of the 10 weeks. Maybe it was good to have the chance to get some things off your chest. Maybe that felt good. But actually, what the study showed, that it was those that would write things that they were grateful for, things, those that had expressed gratitude that were more optimistic, that felt better about their lives, but also they exercised more, they visited the doctor less. And so today, we're going to talk about that topic of thankfulness or gratitude. It's one of the main themes in the letter to the Colossians that Adrian mentioned. It comes up in every chapter, so we're going to hone in on that as we kick off the series today. Before we get there, though, I just want to introduce the book as a whole. As Adrian said, this is a, a letter um, written to a, a New Testament church in a place called Colossae. It's in modern-day Turkey, and it's not one of the really big cities in um, kind of ancient times, but it would have been a slightly smaller city just off a trade route, but it's a really diverse community. So you have some Jews in the community, you have some Greek colonists, you have some locals there, and they've all come together and they've formed this church. What they have in common is their belief in Jesus Christ. They said, yeah, I want to follow the way of Jesus. And Paul hasn't met them yet. Uh, he's heard about them from his friend Epaphras, and so he writes them this letter that starts with these words. He says, this is a letter from me, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and from Timothy, our brother, and I'm writing to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father. As I said, people doesn't, Paul doesn't know this church yet. So the first reason he writes is just to get acquainted, to say, hello, hi, I'm Paul. He was probably in prison at this point, but he wants to get to know these churches that have formed all around the world. But he actually writes with two related purposes in mind. He says in chapter two, my goal is to, and then he says some things that suggest he wants to warn the church. So that's his, kind of the second goal when he's writing this lesson. He warns them with some words like this. He says things like, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow or deceptive philosophy. He says, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. He quotes some others, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. But then he says, these rules, they're based merely on human commands and teachings. The challenge, it seems, for the church in Colossae is a challenge that's not unlike many churches in the New Testament. What we have is a group of people from different backgrounds, and in particular, we have a group from a Jewish culture and those who are not part of Jewish culture, and they're trying to work out as we kind of form these relationships, as we integrate together, what is core? What is the things that we absolutely all of us must do? But also, what are we at risk of maybe importing into our newfound community from the culture around us? And in particular, it seems that what's going on here is there's a group of Jewish believers who are saying, all that stuff that you're doing is enough, but is good enough, but we also think you need you know, circumcision and feasts and festivals and rules and regulations. 
Theologians, theologians call this word syncretism. It's when you kind of bring aspects of your wider culture into the church. But I thought I might explain this with a food example, because I think that always helps, and with apologies to those who haven't had breakfast yet today. <laughs> so what I thought we could do, we're going to talk about some culinary syncretism. If um, I'm going to list a couple of foods that have been mixed together, but sometimes with uh, controversial outcomes. And if you are a fan of this uh, culinary integration, when I put my thumbs up, I want you to say a nice, loud, yum, yum. And when, if I, when I put my thumbs down, I want you to say, no way. Okay, so for example, let's practice. If I say pancakes with bacon on top, if your thumbs up, thumbs down. Oh, okay, so we like pancakes and bacon. The Canadians in the room are feeling pretty good right now. Okay, let's try a couple of others. Milkshake with fries dipped in. Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Oh, don't tell my son. Okay, how about this? Uh, a beef burger with peanut butter on the top. Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Oh, that one's a bit more mixed. Okay, how about this? The, the once and for all pole of poles. Pineapple on a pizza. Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Oh, I don't know. Was that Canada or Italy? I couldn't quite work out who won that one. My, um, my parents, when they went to... I remember growing up when my parents went to an event, a little bit like our commission festival that we'll go to in August, lots of churches or from all around the, the local area. And they did a bit of a game like this where they had to kind of... I mean, they were, they were adults by now, so they really shouldn't have been doing it, but they were daring each other to eat combinations of different foods. And my mum was eating a fruit case slathered with Marmite. And she still to this day said it was a really tasty combination. But I don't know. I think there are some things that are just not made to go together. And that's what Paul says about the gospel and the way that people were speaking to the church in Colossians. He says what's absolutely not compatible in the gospel of Jesus, in the church of Jesus, is for some people to come in and say, there's these things, and I know that Jesus didn't teach them, but we think that you must do them. Ways of life that may kind of set one group of Christians superior to the others or say, these things you must do. These things you have to do, otherwise you're in some way an inferior follower of Jesus. And Paul says, absolutely not. And he warns them about these things. Stay away from them. But he doesn't just say stop. He gives them an alternative. And this is probably the resounding, repeating motif that goes right through the heart of this letter. Paul speaks to them about the sufficiency and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus is enough. Now, to explain this, uh, I thought I'd mention the fact that I'm not a particularly good golfer, but every now and again, I am... Um, I think, you know what, I could play golf. And so I head down to the range, and I think, right, I'm going to try and hit some balls. I'm going to try and hit them straight. Um, just while I tell this story, my clicker's not working at the moment, so I don't know if there's a way to fix it. But... All right, perfect. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, I go down to the range, and I try and hit some balls. And the first one maybe goes straight, but then the second one curls off to the left. I think, oh, this isn't going so well. And so kind of I look, look one way, and I see this guy, he's got a glove on. So I think, I know what I need to do. I need to get a glove. I've got one in the bottom of my bag. So I pull out the glove, strap it on, go back up, have another go. And maybe the first one goes really straight, and then I hit a second one, and it goes off the other way. I was like, no, that didn't fix it. What do I need? Ah, that guy over there has a, I don't know, a tee that's ever so slightly longer. So I you know, go on to Amazon, I think extra long golf tees. That is going to solve all of my problems. They arrive, then put it in, I hit it. No, that's definitely not working. There's all sorts of things I try, right? Like, and YouTube has all sorts of ideas. You can move your feet this way, move your feet that way, slightly change your grip, go faster, go slower, but nothing seems to be working. I cannot get the consistency that I crave. And then someone rocks up next to me, and they're wearing flip-flops and shorts, and they just kind of rock up to the ball, and every single time, 300 yards straight, no left, no right, they've got it down. They've learned how to kind of swing the ball, swing the club, maybe that's where I go wrong, <laughs> swing the club and connect with the ball. Now, I don't want to compare Jesus to a good golf swing, but I think the point that Paul would make to the church is what an experienced golfer might say to me. They'd say, forget about, forget about all this peripheral stuff. Now, this person on YouTube has said, try that. The golfer next to you said, do that. Longer queue, golf clubs, all that stuff is peripheral. Focus on the thing that matters. Learn how to swing the club and hit the ball. And that's what Paul says about Jesus. 
In this context, where there's some that are saying, you know, you need to be circumcised and some need to do festivals and feasts, he says, no, no, think about Jesus, reflect on Jesus, focus on Jesus, the image of the invisible God. He said, if you really want to know what God is like, then look to Jesus. He says, in Jesus, all things were created. Jesus is before all things, and even today, he is holding all things together. Adrian said this a moment ago, in Jesus, God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell. Just reflect on that sentence for a moment. Think, if there is a God that created the universe, that spoke, the, you know, that spoke light, life into existence and placed the stars in the sky, imagine the, the might and the power of that God. And then the love and the justice and the mercy of that God revealed in the scriptures and his justice. And God says, all of the fullness of God dwells in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, through whom God reconciled the whole of the universe to himself. Jesus, through whom God made peace with mankind. Don't settle for anything less. You know, don't settle for circumcision by human hands. Paul says that might have been the way that the, the Jewish people set themselves apart in days gone by, but that is not what defines you anymore. You are defined by your relationship with Jesus Christ, that you were united with him in his death and in his resurrection as you went through the waters of baptism. You are who you are, not because of what you do to your body, but because of what Jesus has done for you. He says, don't settle for rules and for regulations and feasts and festivals. Those were just a shadow of the things to come. Yes, God wants to give you rest and celebration, but that comes truly and fully in knowing the person of Jesus. Don't settle for you can't do that and you must do that. In another letter, Paul says, all things are now yours in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, today, there's all sorts of things, aren't there, that we might believe that we need to do in order to fully live the life that God calls for us. Maybe it's getting a husband or a wife or kids or a job or being on trend or up to date or all sorts of different things. But I think Paul would say the same for us. Don't settle for those things. Don't Focus your energies on what is just a shadow of what can be found in Jesus Christ. Don't spend your life swiping left and right or scrolling up and down on Instagram or getting lost in YouTube rabbit warrens. Don't waste your life on TV and music, all those things. Enjoy them, yes, but focus your life fully and finally on the person of Jesus Christ, the colossal Christ, because he is enough. He's more than enough. And that's what the letter to the Colossians is all about. Verse after verse, chapter after chapter, we are going to be speaking about Jesus Christ. And then Paul launches the letter with this prayer. He writes to this church, he says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from hope stored up for you in heaven, about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. Very briefly, Paul is speaking about that famous wedding service trio, faith, hope, and love. Three things he comes back to in so many of his letters. Faith in Jesus, love for one another, hope in what is to come. I find it a really helpful rubric to think about how am I doing in my walk with Jesus? How is my, how is my trust in him? How is my love for one another? How much of my hope is in, what, in what's to come? And then he encourages them. Remember, the, the church in Colossae won't have social media. They won't have BBC World Service. They won't know what's going on around the world. And so he encourages them. He says, do you know, in the same way, the gospel or the good news about Jesus is bearing fruit. And it's growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. We obviously have social media and the news channels, but it's very rare that you kind of log on to the news and someone will be talking about the way that the gospel is spreading all over the world. It's important to keep these things in mind. Some studies from the Center of Global Christianity suggest that those of kind of any religious faith are growing six times faster at the moment than those who say they had none. Christianity specifically is growing too, especially like churches broadly in our family, kind of Pentecostal charismatic churches. Thank you. There was less than one million people who said, yeah, I'm 
part of that crew in 1900. By 2050, it's expected that that will reach one billion, and it's all over the world. Again, in 1900, there were more Christians in Europe than in the rest of the world combined. Today, Christianity is growing fastest in the global south, the global east. More Christians live in Africa than on any other continent. Keep this in mind as we're speaking about the letter. We might not see it in our day-to-day lives, but the gospel of Jesus is spreading all over the world. Lives are being transformed. People are being set free by the good news of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then Paul prays for this church. He says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. And he defines that in four different ways, four different things that he prays for them. He prays that they would be bearing fruit in every good work. He prays that they'd be growing in the knowledge of God. He prays that they might have great endurance and patience. And then he prays that they may give joyful thanks to the Father. And it's on that final part of this prayer, those final few words, that I'd like us to spend the rest of our time this morning, giving joyful thanks to the Father. That's the big idea. Maybe it feels like a bit of an anticlimax. Really? <laughs> Just saying thank you. <laughs> I learned that in Sunday school. But the reason... I want to talk about it. I think we live in a world where thanksgiving, uh, by which I mean thanking God rather than the American holiday, is um, in relatively short supply. But there's all sorts of other ways that we can live. So I could have talked this morning about the power of the positive confession. I could have named my sermon the attitude of gratitude. But instead, I'm going to go for a slightly more understated, giving thanks to God. Let's compare giving thanks to the culture that I think we often live in. I think we live in a culture of anxiety. We worry a lot. Recent studies suggest that 60% of UK adults experienced anxiety that interfered with their daily life in the last two weeks. Author researcher Andy Crouch says, the defining emotional challenge of our time is anxiety, the fear of what might be instead of the courageous pursuit of what could be. We worry. We compare ourselves to each other. I got to have a holiday from work this week, this year, sorry. Got a few days off. Oh, but my friend got a holiday, and they also went to Dorset or to Devon or to Cornwall. But my friend got a holiday, and they went abroad. And my other friend got a holiday, and they went abroad, and they went further and for longer. Or someone else went twice, or someone else has got a holiday house. Constantly looking right. They've got more. Really interesting study from 2010 about the relationship between income and satisfaction suggested that it wasn't the absolute amount that someone earned that was kind of the biggest driver of how happy they were, but how what they earned compared to their friends. It wasn't the overall level, but your rank amongst your friends that more shaped how happy you felt. A culture of anxiety, a culture of comparison, and This is not a nice word, so I'll explain it, but I think we live in a culture of entitlement. Let me explain what I mean by that. I think if you were to gather a bunch of people in a room, uh, some of whom lived with Paul in the first century, maybe some who lived a thousand years later when William the Conqueror was crossing the channel, maybe some 500 years years later when we were building the printing press, some from the Industrial Revolution, some from the start of the 1900s, And then you had someone from 2024 from the global south, someone from 2024 from the global east, and me, or many people from 2024 in the UK. In all likelihood, the person from the west would have by far the highest living standards, by far the highest earning potential, by far the best healthcare. Let me bring it to life. If you're a single person living in the UK on the minimum wage, that puts you in the top 5% of earners all over the world, even when accounting for differences in cost of living, for the statisticians in the room. (laughs) If you earn an average UK salary, you know, 34, 35,000 pounds a year, puts you in the top 2% of earners all over the world. 
If you lined up everybody in the world from the, the, from the most poor to the most rich and you went to the person right in the middle, so not those in the most extreme poverty, but someone right in the middle, and compare that to an average earner in the UK, the person in the UK would earn 15 times more. And yet, and I can only speak for myself, but my experience has been, ever since I worked, wherever I was on that income scale, a sense that was so easy to kind of come up inside my, in my mind and how I acted that I just need a little bit more. I, and, and I don't really want to wait. I want it now. I, I need it now. And that will make all of the difference. And it's so deceptive because it never is true. I think if all of those people in the room that I described were, were children walking around Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, probably the best characterization of the, in general, someone in the West today would be Veruca Salt the one who has so much, and yet still says, I want it, and I want it now. You may not agree with all three of those areas. This is just my view. The Bible doesn't talk about Veruca Salt. Um, <laughs> but if you think, if you think, oh, you know what, anxiety is a concern. We need to kind of address anxiety. If you think comparison is not healthy for us, if you recognize some aspects of entitlement in the way that you think, I guess I want to spend our remaining time today by asking a question, which is how do we set ourselves free from those things? Now, part of our vision as a church, isn't it, is to help people find freedom. How do we do that? How do we find freedom in these areas? That's why I want to talk about the Christian practice of thankfulness. Now, as I said at the start, I've got four kids at home, so I know that there's a difference between kind of thanks and thanks. I know there's a Oh, Uncle Max, thank you for my present. I really enjoyed this year. Kind of thank you. As well as a more grateful thank you. And it's not that I think the first is bad. Like, I do think it's really important to teach children how to say thank you, even if they don't feel like it and even if it's a bit awkward. But that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a community where we keep the rules and we do the right things and we're saying thank you to the person that we should say thank you to and our thank you letters are not delayed and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about lives that have been transformed by genuine gratitude where kind of the operating system of mind and body is thankfulness to God. Think back to Veruca Salt walking around Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. On the one hand, I do want to say, you know, Veruca, say thank you. It's the right thing to do. But that's not really what we're aiming for. We want a wholesale change in perspective. It's exhausting, isn't it, to live life when you always feel like I need more and I don't know where it's going to come from and my friend has got more than I've got. I'm spending money I don't have, I'm buying things I don't need, I'm doing it spontaneously, and then a few weeks later I'm like, oh, why did I spend money on that? Always feeling like we never have enough. It's exhausting. And I think Jesus has got a better way for his people to live. And that's what I want to speak about today. In fact, this has always been the way of the people of God. The, the Jewish nation actually encoded it in law. So every day they'd be saying their prayers of thanks to God, and then they would go to the Sabbath, and they would have feasts and festivals, but it wasn't just what was in the law. Some of you may know the history of some of the Jewish festivals. They, you know, they defeated the Maccabees and they're like, hey, let's have another festival for that. Anytime they could, thankfulness to God was saturated in right into the heart of Jewish life. And then Jesus continues the trend, right? Before he feeds the 4,000, we read he gave thanks to God. Before he feeds the 5,000, he gave thanks to God. Before he instituted the Lord's Supper, he gave thanks to God. Before he raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus gave thanks to God. After his resurrection, Jesus gave thanks to God. His daily life was, um, was shaped by times away, as Jane spoke about, giving thanks to God. He went to Sabbath, he went to synagogue, he went to feasts and festivals to align his way with the ways of the Lord. He was giving thanks to God. And then Paul tells those in Colossians to do the same. As we've already read, he encouraged them right at the start to give joyful thanks to the Father in chapter 2, he says, live your lives in him, be overflowing with thankfulness. In chapter 3, he says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So let's talk about what this looks like practically. What do we actually mean by having a life shaped by thanks to God? 
And I'm going to tell you how I do it and how we do it in our house. This isn't the only way, <laughs> I'm especially where reading a book like the Colossians, I don't want to impose rules and regulations that I'm absolutely not saying that you need to follow. I just want to share some examples, things that we have found helpful. So in response to culture of entitlement, to the entitlement that I can feel bubbling up inside of me from time to time, I look to combat that with you know, patterns of praise, regular rhythms of thanks in my life. And some of that's daily. For me, this is my drive to the station and my drive back from the station home. It's one of the reasons why I often don't like working from home and I like to go in the office, because I know that I'm going to have time that no one can distract me and I can't distract myself and I can give thanks to God. I'm also lucky enough to be roughly in control of my diary throughout the day, so I can schedule in lots. So if you looked at my work diary, you'd see 15 minutes, 30 minutes here and there, normally in the middle of the day, just to try and escape. I don't always succeed, but to try and escape and pray and to give thanks to God. And it is so good as I work through the morning and there's stressful meetings and there's things to worry about, knowing that I'm never more than a few hours away from a moment of rest, of reset, of connection with God. It's daily, trying to do some of these things weekly as well. It's gathering in the church, committing to be here every week. But some of the things we do in our home as well, one of the things that we've been practicing is uh, thankfulness around our table. Uh, we do this on a, on a Friday night, sometimes more often, but this is where we just try really intentionally to ask everyone at our table, hey, tell me something that you're thankful for to God for. And parents in the room will know that sometimes goes well, sometimes it doesn't go particularly well. <laughs> The amount of times we get the, I'm thankful that you only asked me for one thing, whereas last week I had to say three, or I'm really thankful that my brother isn't annoying me today. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'm really thankful for those things too. But we get really good moments as well together. And at the very least, Rachel and I, assuming we're you know, on our best, get to speak what we are thankful for. And someone summarizes what we've said in prayer. And these rhythms of praise and thankfulness, you know, 300 days a year thanking God, 50 meals a year thanking God, slowly mean that entitlement and needing more and spending what we don't have and desiring more than we need is replaced by thankfulness, by gratitude to God for all the good things that he has given us. Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, always pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. How about anxiety? One of the things I find most helpful here is praying and using the Bible to help me pray. Um, last week when, I was, when we were in worship, I read from Psalm 103, and one of the reasons I did is it's a psalm that we've been trying to learn in our house. So when we're on our way to holiday, we realized that what was meant to be a two-hour journey was going to be a five-hour journey. And so one of the things we thought we could do with the time was to learn the first few verses as a family. And there's four kids, and there's six reasons that the psalmist gives to praise God. And it's about, you know, he forgives my iniquities, he heals, my, um, he heals all my diseases, and he goes on and he finishes. And so our youth is renewed like the eagles. And so we did this in our car. We took it in turns to choose different lines and see if we could memorize them. And then I don't know if it was the Swanage seaside environment or the fact that we'd been on the beach, but... My, um, my nine-year-old Jeremy came to me the next day, and he was so proud because he'd learned all of it. He knew all six. And so slowly, he was, he was telling all of them to me, and he was getting more and more excited. He was like, oh, bless the Lord of my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. And he's saying, he forgives all my iniquity, and he heals all my diseases, and he rescued my life from the pit. And I'm not, yeah, you're doing so well. And he crowns my life with, crowns my head with steadfast love and mercy, and he satisfies me with, me with good. And he reached the crescendo. He got to the final line, so that my youth is renewed like the seagulls. <laughs> So in our house, this will always be the seagull psalm. <laughs> but why are we doing this? Why are we trying to memorize scripture together? You know, isn't that memory verses for Sunday school? Well, this may come as a surprise to you, but there are moments in my life when I know I want to thank God, but I literally don't feel like I have the words to say. So picture the scene. I mean, if you dare, it's seven o'clock in the morning. I've just rolled out of bed. I'm in my Seat Bitha driving down to Woking Station. I've just got annoyed with someone, and I'm worried about how they're feeling. My heating's broken. I'm worried about how, that much, how much that will cost. I've got a meeting at 10.30. I'm worried about how that's going to go. I took a call from my mum last night. I'm worried about some situations she's updated me on. 
You know, I think, oh, I want to pray, but I literally don't have the words. I couldn't string a coherent sentence together if my life depended on it. But one thing that I know that I can do is bring to, a word, bring to my mind and bring to my mouth the words of the Bible. As I'm driving along, I can say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Change gear. <laughs> he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Try and keep my eyes open. <laughs> Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sonship, according to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And he goes on, he speaks about for redemption by his blood and the forgiveness of sins and God's plan for the fullness of time set forth in Christ to unite all things together, all things in heaven and all things on earth. And as I start to speak these scriptures, it's not long before my mind finds things that I am really thankful for. Now, God, I, you know that I'm worried that I'm not going to get chosen for this role or chosen for this promotion or chosen in this relationship or this university or whatever it is. But God, I want to thank you that you have chosen me. You chose me before the foundation of the world, before you knew where you would hang the stars in space. You chose me. You chose your people. You set them apart for your purpose. God, you know that I'm worried about the way that I've lived this week, things that I've done that I shouldn't have, that I, shouldn't, that I should have done that I didn't. I feel like I need to redeem myself, and maybe there's some conversations I need to have, but God, I am so thankful that I don't need to redeem myself because you have redeemed me by your blood, that I have forgiveness of sins. And it's not just you were forced to do it, but Ephesians tell me that you have lavished your grace upon me. It's in accordance with your grace. It's who you are. God, I'm worried about that situation, that diagnosis that I've received in a family or I'm worried about what my friend's going through. Maybe I miss someone who's passed away, but God, I want to thank you for your plan. Your plan for the fullness of time that you have set forth in Christ to unite all things together, the best of earth and the best of heaven, come together in this world that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined. Very quickly, I can say, oh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Speaking the words of Scripture, I find so helpful to combat anxiety and worry in my mind. Maybe it's not Scripture for you. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's set prayers, prayers from the, 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 um, the Book of Common Prayer or some of the Celtic books around teaching us prayers, prayers to pray that when we can't find the words for ourselves, we can bring them to mind. Maybe it's songs. Maybe the songs are the easiest to remember. Make it a good one. But there are some brilliant truth in songs that we can celebrate. You know, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm heir of salvation. I'm purchase of God. I'm born of his spirit. I'm washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. I'll be praising my Savior all the day long. Songs and scriptures are a launch pad to thanks and to praise. And it's what Paul tells the church in Philippi. He says, don't be anxious about anything. But he doesn't just say, don't worry and leave it at that. He says, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. For coming into land, I wonder if the band could join me. We're going to finish today with a time of communion, um, which is a great way to say thanks to God for all that he has done for us. And so just in a moment, as the band are singing, um, the wine and the bread will come round the room it's alcohol-free wine, it's gluten-free bread, so you can take it if you would wish to join us. Uh, this is probably the one part of the service that we would say it is for those who are Christians or who, who want to follow Jesus. It's a meal that Jesus set out for those who believed in him. And so if that's not you, maybe just let it pass for today. But we're going to end with a time of communion. Before we do, I want to just speak about the final aspect of our cultural diagnosis that I think Thanksgiving is an antidote for, and that is comparison. In Luke's biography of Jesus, he tells about this moment when Jesus chooses his 12 disciples. There's lots of people he could have chosen from. He chose 12, and he sent them out. He said, heal the sick and do all the things that I've been doing, and they go and they do it. But then in the very next chapter, he chooses another 72, and he tells them to go out and do the same. 
Now, this may be my, just my uh, personality, but I think if I was in the 72, I might be feeling a bit disappointed that I hadn't made the 12, but I'd be thinking, you know what? If I could get a 14th or 15th on the list, I wonder if I might be able to sneak in. I've heard there's a few wrong ones in the 12. I reckon I might be able to get into 12th place. I reckon I might be able to heal a few more people than they did. And so they go out and they do the stuff, right? Bingo, it's all happening, just what they thought. They're looking at their peers. They're like, yeah, we can do this too. And then they go back to Jesus and they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus' response is fascinating. He says, on the one hand, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It's a warning about pride. But then he says this, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It is good, I think, to give thanks to God for all the things that he has given us in this life, all the blessings that we have. But ultimately, our thanks is derived from this, that our name is written in heaven, that Jesus has saved us. Jesus says, don't rejoice, don't find joy, don't be happy ultimately in the stuff, however good it is, but find hope in this, that your name is written in heaven. In the book of life, in this certificate or this um, family certificate of what it means to be part of God's people, this inheritance document for Jesus, this legal deed, and it says St. Paul, and it says Epaphras, and it says Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and Augustine, and Thomas Aquinas, and John Calvin, and Mother Teresa, but the name of everyone in this room who has placed their trust in Jesus is written in heaven. Timothy Keller, when he just before he passed away last year, in his final email to John Piper, spoke about this very verse. And he'd been really successful. For those of you that know Tim Keller, he wrote really good books. He pastored a church really well. He was a great husband. He was a great dad. But he came to the end of his life. That's not what he was giving thanks for. It wasn't the service that he was delighting in. It was his saviour. As I encourage you into thanksgiving this week, I want to encourage you to do the same. Don't celebrate that you are successful, but celebrate that you are saved. That Jesus has saved you, that he's taken you from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. That you have redemption, that you have forgiveness for sins. Thanks be to God for what he has done. So let's stand, let's sing one song, and then let's have a time of communion to give thanks to Jesus for all that he has done. Hey guys, before you go, we just want to say a massive thank you for watching this video today. My name's Chris. I'm part of the leadership team here at the Beacon Church. You know, as a church, we have a big vision. We believe that we exist to help people to know God, to find freedom, to discover their purpose and to make a difference. If this video has made a difference in your life today, then make sure you check out our other content in our playlist. We believe it's going to really help you out. And don't forget to like and subscribe as you go. Well, that's all from me today. Take care. God bless.